So the, the, the title of my paper this afternoon is uh, Playing with Our Ancestors, Culture, Community, and Communal Memory uh, in Igbo Masquerade Theater. Now, I have to say, uh, I didn't discover Igbo Theater, the Masquerade Theater, until I arrived in the UK in 1986. And that was because the, the theater was something, the masquerade was something that I was part of. I was initiated as a 10-year-old boy uh, who, was, who grew up in the city, but dragged home by my father to be initiated into the masquerade. And so something that was around you all the time, you grew up with it, and, and, and then it just became part of the furniture. It just became what you did. So, Part of what I've been trying to do ever since also is while I've been engaging with the uh, Igbo Masquerade Theater, I've also been trying to interrogate it in so many ways. And some of that will come through uh, in, my, in, my, in my presentation today. Now, one of my uh, inspirations for exploring uh, Igbo Masquerade Theater was something that I read uh, when I was still doing my PhD. It, was, it wasn't relevant to my PhD. Uh, but at the, at the same time, it was in so many other ways, in the sense that I came across Victor Turner's book, you know, and Victor Turner's research about ritual, especially ritual among the Ndembu uh, uh, ethnic group in, 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 in Southern Africa. And one of his conclusions was that, that he said that, he, that cultures are, fully, are most fully expressed and made conscious of themselves through their rituals and theatrical performances. And then Turner goes on to add in the same uh, 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 book, you know, that performances suggest the uniqueness of the culture out of which it has emerged. And that remained with me. And as I said, I didn't think a lot about Igbo masquerades. I didn't think about the masquerades in my town. I, I participated in it, and I did it. It was routine. But I started valuing it when I came here. And that's something that it taught me that you, re you realize your culture a lot more when you are away from it. You know, and that's quite important, especially uh, what uh, uh, the professor who welcomed us talked about, especially about our diaspora Africans, that we, you, know, you know who you are by knowing who you are not. And you are confronted by who you are not a lot more when you are outside of your culture. So it's important for us. It's important for our children as well. So although I have called the paper Playing with Our Ancestors, the Igbo masquerade is play because it's theater, but it's much more than that. It is a very serious business, as I'll try to show, and, and why it is, for me, important and and, and necessary for us to understand it, but at the same time uh, to, to look at what it does, what it can do, what benefits that it has for us, and especially that ties in with the theme of this conference, memory, uh, uh, communal memory history, you know, and, 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 and so for me, theater has always been a record of memory. And for us in Igbo land, the masquerade is the one single theater that we have. If anybody knows of any Igbo theater, let me know because that's, I'm interested in finding out. But the Igbo theater, or rather the masquerade is the, is the singular Igbo theatrical performance. And of course, that also has some problems attached to that as I also try and uh, bring out uh, uh, in my paper. You know, so as I said, Cultures are most fully expressed and made conscious of themselves through their rituals and theatrical performances. And then, uh, uh, that while declaring our shared humanity, performances by, uh, perform, uh, uh, humanity, performance, and then when we talk about performance, you notice that I, I try not to use the word theater a lot. I, I, I talk about performance a lot more, but that's, that's to do with the discipline that I mean. And uh, it's... Uh, the, post, the colonial and post-colonial struggles that have attended, attended it in terms of whether Africans uh, actually have what can be called theater or not. So performance scholarship has uh, 
scholarship has moved on to talk about performance theory more than dramatic theory or, or theater theory. So when I talk about performance, we're looking at rituals, we're looking at sports, festivals. So whether it is wrestling that people do in the villages, is a form of, these are forms of performances, and communal parades, you know, and other such activities. You know? So every performance suggests the uniqueness of the culture out of which it has, uh, uh, out of which it has come. You know? Secondly, every culture has its own tradition of theater and performance. That's very important for me, because I remember as, a, as an undergraduate student in, 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 at Unsuka uh, in the 70s, you know, not being able to study anything to do with my local Igbo Anambra state uh, activities. We were studying Shakespeare. We were studying Aristotle, the poetics. These were the things that were presented to us as the documents you know, that talk about drama, that talk about theater. And so a lot of Western scholars concluded that Africans didn't have theater. We weren't sophisticated enough to develop theater. You know, so, but that part of my research has always been to show that you do not use your own frames of reference to measure what exists in another culture. You have to ask that culture what it conceives of as theater, what theater means for them. So in one of my books, I, I, I tried to find a word for theater from different African ethnic groups. And I was amazed that all of them come down to the word play. So if, for instance, you ask an Igbo person, what is egu? What is egu? It's music, it's dance, it's play. It's so many things. It's a verb, it's a noun. You know, depending on how you configure it. But that, that word, and the same applies to the Hausa language, to Yoruba, uh, to, to some of the ethnic groups that I, 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 I research into in Ghana. You know, so every culture has its own framework and language for organizing, presenting, describing, and assessing its artistic impulses and manifestations. And, and the same applies to the Igbo. So one of the things we, we need to do you know, I'm, I'm getting old now, so it's not, it's not research that I particularly want to do now, uh, but that's something that I've been throwing out to my students, uh, to my colleagues in the African Theatre Association, that they should research into these things, find out what each culture understands its theatre to be, and you start from there. Now, I've always believed that culture and performance have a very close relationship, you know, you know and the, this relationship is a mutually affective one, you know, and, and the same applies to the Igbo, Igbo culture, you know. The relationship, as I said, is dialectical, that is, the two mutually affect one another. On one hand, culture provides the source and the material for, for the theater, while the theater, on the other, reflects and has the capacity to change the culture. We'll come back to that a little bit, and probably during question time, in terms of what can, how can Igbo, Igbo masquerades help, contribute, but also interrogate and potentially change Igbo structures. We'll, we'll come to that later on. Now, every art form, uh, and this includes the theater, belongs to an age, a place, a specific geographical, social, and cultural context. Now, let's look at Igbo mask and Igbo culture and society, because you can see how, when we understand that, understand Igbo religion, then we begin to link that to the masquerade, then that can help us to begin to understand how the masquerade as an institution and as a, as a practice has the potential and does contribute to Igbo memory, Igbo collective history, and in other, in other significant ways. So, Igbo masking theater is informed and shaped by Igbo history and contemporary realities, you know, while Igbo culture and society are in turn revealed in and through the masquerade performances. Can I just make an apology here that I, I'm not likely to show you any videos or anything because there's quite a lot of them on YouTube. So people can, uh, uh, which is quite a great thing that people can uh, do so for themselves now. You know? So Igbo mass performances offer glimpses of processes 
and the instances of the mediations and negotiations between the theater and Igbo culture and society. The theater also captures the religious pragmatism of the Igbo, who, although most have converted to Christianity, yet display an ambivalent attitude bordering on reverence when in the presence of the mask figure. I don't know how, how it is in your own parts of Igbo land, because I also need to point out that although we say Igbo masquerades, the tradition exists in different forms in different places. You know, I know I grew up in Omaha here, for instance, and I know that my, my friends, when we were in primary school, did not do the ordeal of initiation that I went through with my younger brother at the age of 10. You know, so when I talked about the kind of things we went through, for them, you didn't need to be initiated to become, to take part in the masquerade, whereas I come from Mpo in the Demili local government area. It is mandatory that you must be initiated into the masquerade uh, uh, in order to become a fully active, participating member. Incidentally, only men, and we'll come to that too. Uh, that's part of the, some of the things that I'm, I'm, I've been looking at. You know, so that what, what I was saying is that although, and that, that, that's something that I also want people to think about, is that a lot of Igbo people have converted to Christianity, but we haven't completely gotten rid of our indigenous beliefs in the existence of spirits and the ability of those spirits to influence our lives. You know, so, so that pragmatism, that religious pragmatism is manifested in the masquerade. So when people see the masquerade, because they are believed to be spirits, people defer to them in so many ways, and that is what gives mas the masquerade its power. The fact that people defer to it. You know, and we can see how that potential and the capacity you know, to be deferred to also plays into the power of the masquerade as an instrument that can contribute for, for good in the society. So, but what I'm saying is that people, people might think that they have become Christians, but that we haven't completely lost our indigenous uh, African and Igbo religious thinking. And I'll, 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 I'll talk about that uh, uh, later on. So, so but my, my sense is that this attitude of deference or pragmatism uh, vividly reflects the conflicted pull the Igbo feel between their acquired Christian faith and doctrine and the abiding residual belief of, of our pre-Christian Igbo religion, which is in the existence of spirits and the ability of these spirits and ancestors to influence human life. This reverence for spirits, including ones that appear in the form of masquerades, is fascinating on the one hand, but also troubling on another, because it involves a power relationship. And when I talk about the, the power relationship between spirit and matter, which underpins Igbo traditional religion, you can then begin to see uh, where the masquerade becomes the powerful instrument I said that it can be uh, in terms of uh, contributing socially, uh, politically, and culturally as well to Igbo life. Now, Igbo patriarchy, in my view, uh, is reflected by the structure and content of the institution of the masquerade, in which women are excluded as active participants, even though they make up a significant percentage of society uh, and the audience. You know, as I said, that's something that we need, and it's not peculiar to Igbo land, you know, that women are excluded from, from, from the theater. Uh, now, I want us to move to the idea of the mask in Igbo land. You know, so the art of the masquerade performance in Igbo land is religious and theatrical, which is what I started with. It's play, but it is serious. You know, it's not just play. You know? So it is ritual and it is entertainment at the same time. So traditional Igbo religion, as I said, is based on the belief in the existence of spirits and their ability to influence human life. In addition, Igbo religion espouses an essential dualism of spirit and matter in everything, you know, I, and which is one of the things I have, I've always found fascinating, the fact that everything that exists has its spiritual component, but it also has its material component. So, and the Igbo talk about it in terms of ifa polo ifa kudebie. You know, nothing, is, nothing stands on its own. What you see, there's also an aspect of it that you do not see. And we'll see how, at the, at, the, at the 
at the end of it all, religion is almost and is always about trying to understand what we cannot see, trying to negotiate, trying to understand master and control and make use of those things that we cannot see, but we must not ignore them. Life is about balance between the two of them. You know, so, and that dualism you know, underpins uh, Igbo, uh, Igbo traditional uh, religion. You know? Now, the other point is that there's, there's this mutual dependence between the spiritual and the material, and that mutual dependence plays a, 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 across all kinds of interaction and relationship uh, between the spiritual world and, and, and the material uh, human world that we live in. Now, like there are other neighbors, the Igbo place the spiritual over the material in the scheme of things. You know, uh, and, and that's, not, that's not unusual because in most cultures, the spiritual is, almost, is always above the material. Uh, the paradox anyway, if, uh, is that a lot of times, and this, this sometimes ruffles a lot of sensitivities wherever I have said it, which is that, that, that it is the human, it is the material that creates the spiritual. You know, uh, and I've, I've said it more graphically elsewhere that in Africa, we make gods in our own image, not the other way around. It is the human beings who create the gods and make the gods to serve them, not the other way around. In Christianity, we were created in God's image. Who has seen God? And nobody has, so how can, you, how, can you, how can you be made in the image of something you haven't seen? But we create gods and we give them human form. And of course, you can see how that is central to Igbo masking, you know, giving form to the spirit. You know, so whenever I say in Africa we make our own, we create gods, and if we don't, and that's why we have many of them. If they don't perform, you throw them away and create a new one. You know, so, and so, of course, my European friends, whenever you say it, people, and especially some, even some African super Christians, they say that, that they, they see you as, uh, as a very dangerous person. <laughs> but, uh, but all I'm just saying is that I've studied a lot of cultures and I've studied religions. That's precisely what religion does. You know, every religious doctrine, every religious philosophy, every religious practice or context that I've looked at does the same thing. We give form. We try to humanize the gods because that's the only way we can understand them. We assign the roles that we want them to perform for us and we expect them to. You know, and where they don't, they have to answer for it. You know, I think Wole Shoenka was the one who, who really expressed that very well when he said that any new, any new religion is, a, is lining some men's pockets, you know? And of course, uh, in, in, in Achebe's uh, Arrow of God, we, we know what happened to Ezolo, you know, when he, he became too big for his boots. Uh, at the end of the day, people went and offered sacrifice or offered their first yam to the church because he was trying to hold them to, uh, uh, he was trying to hold the entire community hostage. You know, but the point I'm trying to make is that gods survive, thrive, as long as they keep their own side of the contract. If they don't, the sacrifices will go elsewhere, and the priests will lose their job. And, and that's, 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 that's precisely it. So it is the human beings who are at the center of the world. You know, so when we talk about the spirits, on the one hand, we give them reverence, we, re we revere them, we place them above ourselves. But we place them there because we want them to do something for us. And when they don't, we revise that. So just to look at uh, 
theater and religion, basically, you know, in many parts of the world, theater and performance have always been associated with religion, whether whichever history, whichever theater history you start from. In the West, they start their theater history from the Greeks. It is to do with Dionysus, the worship of Dionysus. The performances were on the hillsides, you know, in worship of, of Dionysus. Every culture in the world, go to India, Japan, uh, China, all their indigenous performances have some elements and some form of connection to religion. And the same applies to us in Iberland. You know, the masquerade, as I said, is how do we get these spirit forces that we cannot see? How do we get these ancestors who have died, but who have not died, who are still part of us, who are still influential in our lives, who will, not, who will never abandon us? How do we get them to physically come back and interact with us so that we can ask them questions. You know, it's not sometimes uh, uh, prayers take too long to materialize. You know, you pray and pray and then nothing happens. You know, Igbo religion doesn't believe in the last judgment. You know, if something happens, you need a solution now and you want that solution now. You want somebody to tell you precisely what you need to do to get on. You know, so... You can see how the masquerade is, is one of those forms of practice that allows us to humanize the gods you know, in a very, very pragmatic way. So we can ask them questions. We can, we can find out answers from our ancestors. And that's why I talked about playing with them. So we play with them because we have to cajole them. We have to persuade them. You know, and they can touch us. We can touch them. We can interact with them in a kind of physical way. You know, but we get direct answers from them. And a lot of uh, indigenous African religions are about quick fire answers because we need it quite a lot. You know, so waiting for prayer that you don't even know if, if God has heard you or not. You know, African religion doesn't work that way. You have to get the answer. Uh, I think the, the, the new churches are trying to do that, aren't they? You know, they are trying to move away from the state Catholic. I'm a Catholic, so by the way, I still go to church every Sunday. <laughs> so, so, as insurance, somebody say yes. <laughs> so, the point is that theater has always been closely related to religion. You know, the need to understand the world we live in uh, is satisfied by our religious pursuits. So religion enables us to make sense of the world, give it a structure, especially the unseen elements of our world. You know, so that's what religion does. Every religion does it. And then, of course, religion has ritual practices. Most religions have ritual practices embedded within them. So while religion enables humans to understand the world, ritual provides them with a means to use that understanding in a positive way to control the unseen forces to control the unseen parts of the world. That's what, that's what rituals uh, uh, do. So while religion is theory, idea, ritual is practice and action. Now, Hebrew religion is made up of three worlds, the world of the dead, the world of the living, and the world of the unborn. And again, Igbo religious thought shares this with other African religions. You know, the three worlds correspond to the past, that's the dead, the present, that is us, and the future, the unborn. And overarching the three and mediating and in between and intervening directly in them is the world of the gods and the deities, you know, and the nature forces. And that's the kind of relation. So they are all connected by constant movements between them. You know, there's constant movement and interaction between these three worlds and together with the world of the, the gods and the deities. As I said, we create the gods and we create them to be functional for us. So we make requests from them. Uh, we, we expect answers from them. But there's also movement between the three worlds of the Igbo universe. You know, people, people die. They become ancestors. You know, people are born. They become the, 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 uh, the, the living community. You know, and there's movement between them. How many people here have heard of, oh, my father has returned to me? You know, reincarnation, the concept of reincarnation. We ask the, the deities for children. 
we offer sacrifices to them, we get married, perform the traditional marriage rites in order to qualify us to, to, to have children, in order to qualify us to become uh, uh, married people who can then bring children into the world. So there's constant movement between, the, but no movement can happen between these worlds without a, a form of rite, a form of ritual has to happen. And most societies do that. So people will ask questions, for instance, why is it necessary to have a wedding before having children? Of course, a lot of people do that now without caring. But in, but in most places, you are expected to go through a formal process of becoming qualified or authorized uh, to get married or to move uh, 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 transition. And people, can, when people die, if you don't bury them properly, they become the spirit of the restless dead because they won't go away. They worry you. you know, so these things exist uh, as part of our world. You know? So they are connected by these movements. You know, these movements are articulated by religion and made possible by various rites of passage and transition. You know? And the mass trade, in my view, is one such rite of passage between the living and the dead and between the spiritual world and the material world. So, Igbo masquerade theatre is the Igbo people's playful way of dealing with the universe within which we live, actualizing and interacting with all the super, superhuman forces which exist within our world. It is a mode of a mode through which we achieve transport into an imaginary and higher reality via the creative world of play. So that's why the word play, because it is theater, is central to, what I'm, uh, to my paper. You know. But it is much more serious than just play because of the active religious intent underneath it. Because you ask, why do we perform? You know, can our theater be free from any social function or social relevance? My argument is that most art forms in African context are functional. You know, people make art because the art is supposed to contribute, it's supposed to be part of the social. I see, I see art as a cultural practice, but I also see it as a process, you know, as part of the uh, 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 collective social and cultural processes that societies have. So masking is a useful and, and, and vital ritual of return which enables the ancestors or the spirits to visit in order to <coughs> commune with the living human community, or albeit playfully. So the mass contribute towards ensuring the survival and the continuity of Igbo culture, and that's where it is crucial and, and relevant to the conference today. You know, it is through the mass creates that the Igbo ancestors and nature gods participate directly and physically in human affairs. When they come as masks, we play with them, we feed them, we bribe them, and we even scold them when they have let us down. We can touch and hear them and be touched and be heard by them. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the mask design, because again, it is through the design that that function of being part of memorializing Igbo culture, Igbo history, is achieved. It is the way the masks are designed. You know? So through conception and design, the masks, uh, uh, through the conception and design of the masks, Igbo the Igbos embody and encode Igbo past, present, and projections of the future. A major feature of Igbo masking theater is the high level of abstraction that occurs, irrespective of the type of mask that it is. Uh, symbolism, is the main mode of signification. So a lot of Igbo masks are not trying to capture a, an actual human face. Even when it is a human face, it is distorted in such a way that it is, it, it, it is not specific to a particular character. It is a type. And even now, in, more, in some of the recent mass craze that I have watched, uh, incidentally, the last I watched was more than 10 years ago, you know, but that I noticed a trend where they were trying to create human faces in the characters, you know, but that they still tried uh, in those faces to create faces that were generic, you know, that were not particular. So it can be, be a beautiful young woman or uh, a dashing, powerful young man or a, a wealthy 
parent or something like that. So those are the kind of characters that uh, that they that you find uh, uh, in the in the mass. The mass are tried there to capture ideas, you know, values uh, of, of 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 Igbo Igbo culture and Igbo history, and then try to uh, and you have to you have to buy into the uh, the codes. The, the, the course of the semiotic processes that the society has in order to be able to understand. So when a masquerade appears, those who know, know what that masquerade means, know what is expected of that masquerade, how that masquerade is supposed to behave or perform. And if it doesn't, that becomes a criticism against it or against the performer. So symbolism enables the accumulation and dissemination of collectively held values and frames of reference. So, but basically, there are as many mask types as there are Igbo ideas and experiences. Uh, whatever does not appear as a character or represented within the world of this theater does not exist, has not yet happened, or is, is outside the universe of Igbo experience. Now, just to show you some of the, 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 the mask that I, this one in particular I like, I like this particular mask a lot. Uh, I have a history with it. Uh, over a period of time between 1993 and 2000, when I used to, I had some research funding that allowed me to travel back to, uh, to Nigeria every year. So this particular mask uh, became a good friend of mine. You know, so each time, this, this was, uh, and it's called Akwezu Ozo. I don't know if you understand what that means. Ozo is the, is the title, the highest title, one of the titles of, of status in Igbo land. And his name is that wealth is not enough for it. You know? Uh, and it's supposed to represent the ancestral mask, the ancestral character of my own hometown. And... Every year, you know, when I used to come to record, on, at the end of the festival, because he's the, he, he's the last to arrive and the first to leave at the, first, the annual festival, he would try to seek me out wherever I am with my camera <laughs> and then ask me if I have got a good photograph. <laughs> you know, and, uh, so I used to be, it's, it's a character I like a lot, so... It, and so he just, this, he did this one. He found me where I was trying to record other people and he just posed for me. And then I got this wonderful photograph. But look at the face. You know, it's, it's amazing, the face. Uh, but that if you look at that face, is he handsome? <laughs> what does he look like? What does he say to you? But the face, suppose, in the way the Akwezuzo is put together, you know, you look at the head. He has a red cap. Of course, everybody knows that you don't put on a red cap for fun in Igbo land, especially in my own part of Igbo land. You have to be a chief to put that on. You also have to earn those feathers. You know, they are not vulture feathers. They are not chicken feathers. They are eagle feathers. You know, an eagle, you don't see eagle every day in Igbo land. Eagle, to see an eagle is an honor. And to have as many eagle feathers as he has. What's that? Five minutes. Oh, God. Okay. okay. So, but that's our question. But if you look at him, he represents something. He represents nobility. He represents age, wisdom. You know, every kind of thing that you can imagine that a traditional responsible person does. And, of course, he has his elephant tusk. On his shoulder. Does anybody here know what elephant tusks are supposed to also signify? It's wealth. You know, how many people have seen elephants in their lifetime? Live elephants. So he owns an, a tusk and he uses it to speak, to talk as he, as he, as he, as he travels through the town. That's another mask. They're not as ugly as, they're not, not, all, not all our masks are that ugly. That's one, this one, the face is cut off a bit, but this is Adama, uh, another masquerade that I recorded uh, when I was doing my research. That's another type. I'll, I quickly pass through. Now, that's the Ijele, isn't it? 
uh, which incidentally I saw in the poster today, so which is great. Again, Ijele, uh, because I need to, my, my talk ends with the Ijele, because for me, the Ijele is the mass create that captures this whole function, uh, uh, this whole function of, uh, of the mass create as, an, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a space and a canvas for memory, you know? I, I, I first watched, I watched my first Ijele at the age of four on the back of my grandmother, you know? And I, I was fascinated by the Ijele. That was in the, uh, I think, early, early 60s or something. No, I think it was 1960. And, and I remember the first thing that struck me about the Ijele was that I was fascinated by the the the, the, the the carving of a district of a, a white colonial district officer on a motorbike. You know, and I kept asking my grandmother, who's that? Who's that? Now, that particular Ijela, and I've watched it over so many years since. And one of the things I found that each time I watch it, I try to look for the new things that have been added onto it. So alongside the district officer, I remember uh, immediately after the Civil War, immediately after the Biafra War, the first things that I noticed were the uh, jet bombers and fighters, the soldiers, you know, and all of those paraphernalia of war. One of the things I also noticed was the rising sun. The yellow sun was there. You know, so every year, things are added onto it. The last time I watched, now they had mobile phones, <laughs> uh, 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 computers, floppy disks, you know, everything... So what the, what the IJLE does is that they study what is going on within Igbo society, whatever Igbo experience has happened, and they find a way for it to find space on the IJLE. So unlike other masks, that once you carve them, they remain like that. The IJLE grows, the IJLE defies, IJLE doesn't want to be fixed because it is, it is the Igbo world dancing. It is the Igbo world in motion you know, and, and so it's a mass that fascinates me quite a lot, you know, and that's why I know some of my uh, colleagues in the African Theatre Association are here today, and they can now understand why I have Ijele as the emblem of the African Performance Review, you know, because for me, Ijele represents that ability, you know, but that ability for a culture to constantly reinvent itself, to constantly revise itself, because that's how cultures survive. You don't survive by closing yourself in, you survive by leaving yourself open to new experiences, by finding ways to understand those experiences, but also to make those experiences work for you. And I, I have so much to say, but I need, I think I will just stop, you know, but. Of course, you know why that, hunt, that uh, flute is going on. It's trying to sing my praises. <laughs> By the way, that is Dr. Kene Iguangu. He was my co-editor in one of the books that was mentioned. He's also a lecturer at, at Canterbury Christ Church University. Now, I can take some of your questions and I hope I'll be able to answer them. Yes, the lady over there. Yes, please. Thank you. My name's Chinye, um, and I do storytelling, and it's really, it really helps me to connect with my Igbo culture. So you talk about the um, masquerade, the Ijele, the Ijele, evolving with what's going on in life. So, but at the beginning you said that the masquerade was only masculine. So do you think then the Ijele will evolve to include the feminine? <laughs> jo, jo, uh, I don't know. <laughs> but I hope, 
I don't know, but I hope. Now, if you notice that I've been tr I tried to be very diplomatic, uh, I haven't tried to reveal the secret of the mask because I'm not allowed to. I swore an oath as a 10-year-old not to tell anybody what I saw or what I, I was told. Now, I didn't, I didn't notice the marginalization of women in, in Igbo masquerade until I was given a paper uh, in Tel Aviv in 1993. And I was, everybody was wrapped. I was trying to introduce this wonderful tradition to, to my colleagues in, in, at the university in Tel Aviv. And there was this old woman who sat at the back, a white Israeli woman, and she was nodding and nodding. I thought, oh, she was agreeing with me. <laughs> and when I finished, she, her hand just went up and she said, where are the women? You know, and I've never thought of, I'd never thought of it before. But that became a research project of mine afterwards. So that's why I said, unfortunately, I didn't get to that. But I, think, I hope they will put this on the, on, 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 on the Igbo conference website, you know, for people to have a look. You know that I also went to Mali among the Bamana, and I studied the Koteba. And I also noticed the same thing. And I also started studying other traditions. And I remember asking them, in, in Mali, in a town called Makala, and I was saying, how come women and men belong to the youth association? Once a woman reaches 25 years of age, she stops being a member. If she gets married before then, she also stops being a member, whereas the men continue. Only the men put on the mask rates, only the men perform it, the women are on the periphery. And I found a, a similarity between that and Igbo mask. So I wrote a paper on it, and I, which I called uh, Through Other Eyes and Voices, Women in Africa, in, in Igbo, um, Mon, and Koteba. And I was trying to explore this and to raise those questions, because I asked the women about it in Mali. They, didn't, they, 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 for the first, they hadn't thought about it. The men said, why are you trying to ask silly questions, you know? <laughs> And I went, to my, I went back to Mpo, and I was asking questions. I was saying, how, why is it that my sister was not initiated when I was? Why was it that one of the oaths I swore was not to disclose what I learned for, to my mother and to my sister? You know, why are they being the ones that are targeted? And nobody, they were saying, why are you asking these questions? Why are you asking these questions? The only person who answered it eventually was my uncle before he died. He kept evading and one day I asked him, I said, look, and he said, look, ask me whatever you want now, because you're not going to see me when you come back the following year. And he said that part of the institution of the mass trade is as an agent of social control. And that the women were one of the people that they wanted to control. <laughs> and so he said, if you give them the tool of control, then you lose the battle. You know? So but what I'm saying is, Yes, the masquerade needs to look at itself. It, they represent female characters. They represent female characters on the ejele, on as characters, but they are performed by men. And the fact that women do not have that power, for me, is a denial, denial of the right to speak, the denial of the right to answer back, because people put on the mask, a satirical mask or whatever, and they make fun of other people. They criticize people for what they've done wrong, and then if you're a man and somebody criticizes you, you can stand there and challenge them and speak back to them. Or you can create your own character that can answer back. The women don't have that. So we need to address that. So that's why I pointed out that, yes, the masquerade tradition represents the culture out of which it has come. And Igbo society is essentially patriarchal. And that patriarchy is well embedded and manifested in the masquerade itself. So how, how do we open it up? I ask women in my village, and they say, oh, we're not interested in that, you know? And, uh, so we need re-education to let them know that the act of public speaking is where decisions are made. It's where politics is played. And if you cannot stand in front of everybody and state your own case. I don't know if that answers your question. Excuse me. I there's, have a a gentleman at, there's a gentleman at the back, and then there's a lady. A lady. Wait. 
Oh, sorry, okay. I'm sorry. sorry. My question, sorry, goes sort of somewhat in a similar direction, uh, which is that you, you stated that women do not participate in masquerades. Um, I've seen many masquerades in Evo Land, and I, I think I've seen different things than you have. Of course, me being a woman, I see it differently. My question, of my, my question to you mm. um, is along two lines. One is performance. You have elaborated on the concept of performance, and what I would like to, you, to know from you, or maybe to interrogate more, is performance possible without audience? For example, you are performing um, your presentation for us. Mm. Just imagine if we are not here, none of us is here, there's no audience, an empty audience. What is your performance? And the second question is about mythology. Have you ever looked at the myth of origin of masquerades and where are women in those myths? Okay. I, think, I think in answer to the first question, I teach theater, that's my job. You know, and I always tell my students, if you perform and there's no audience, there are three key elements of performance. The space, the performer, and the spectator. If you take away any, or any of them, you don't have it. So if you take away the, perform, the, 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 the spectator, what you have is a rehearsal. <laughs> you know, so, And the, in answer to your second question, the mythology. To be honest with you, I have not researched it, but one of the things that I find fascinating, which is the next thing I want to look at, is to see the connection between masking in Igbo land and what it, it has with a gala, you know, in Benue State. Because in my hometown, a very powerful masquerade is normally referred to as Atane Gala. I don't know uh, people who come from Ide Mili or other parts of. So if, I want to trace that connection. Did masquerade in Igbo land come from a gala? How did it start? Because nobody could answer that question when I was saying, how did it begin? People gave you different versions of the story. But as I said, if I still have time and, and health, it's something that I would like to look into to understand where it has come from, what brought it about, and maybe to begin to understand why women were singled out. Because the other group of people that the masquerade, in my, as I was told, was to do with strangers. The outside world you know, was also seen as it has to be, uh, the outside world has to be filtered through the masquerade. You know, the, the masquerade was powerful enough, it can negotiate with the outside by domesticating the outside first. You know, so that's, that's, that's research for another day.